Order, order. Nicola Richards to move the motion. Thank you, Dr Hook. It is a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and I beg to move that the House has considered the HIV Action Plan annual update 2022-23. I'm pleased to have been successful with my application for this debate and I thank colleagues from across the House for attending. I'd like to start by thanking the Government for fulfilling its commitment to update Parliament on the progress it has made on the HIV Action Plan, which I fully support, as it's crucial that members are given the opportunity to scrutinise the progress that we are making on tackling HIV. We are the generation which has the golden chance to end new cases of HIV, HIV by 2030. It's vital that we do all we can to ensure this becomes a reality. Positive progress has been made to this end, which is highlighted within the report. However, there remains further opportunities to stop new HIV transmissions in this country. This would certainly be a lasting legacy that the government can be proud of. Two measures in particular will help ensure that the government fulfills its mission to turn the tide on HIV for once and for all. Firstly, opt-out testing is the hidden tool in our armoury which is want waiting to be unleashed. Just last December, I spoke in the House during the World AIDS Day debate about how effective opt-out test testing was in those places that already have introduced it. This is one of the... Of course. Where how health practitioners in Blackpool have led the way on opt-out testing to achieve great results. The focus on this in high prevalence areas is, of course, particularly important. But does she agree with me, although the NHS is making solid progress in this regard, it really does need to up its game if it's going to achieve its own targets by 2025? <laughs> thank, thank my humble friend. And I know that opt-out testing is already making uh, improvements. Uh, and I know that this will benefit his constituents in Blackpool. We've got the blueprint for how to do this. We just need to roll it out further. So the numbers do not lie. The annual, uh, the annual update revealed that more than 2,000 2, people have been diagnosed with HIV, hepatitis B and hepatitis C in 12 months alone. Without opt-out testing, it's very likely that many of these people would not have been diagnosed until a much later stage. This includes diagnosis, diagnosis in parts of London, clusters having a high rather than very high prevalence of HIV. Imagine what can be achieved if we now extend the rollout to areas of high, high HIV prevalence, like in my constituency of West Bromwich East. The West Midlands have several high prevalence areas outside of Samwell, including Wolverhampton, Coventry and Birmingham. And that's why, for World AIDS Day last year, West Midlands Mayor Andy Street joined the calls to fund this scheme in the West Midlands. The way to end this virus is to find exactly these people, those who are unaware that they are carrying the disease, but who are in fact passing it on to others, so that they can get the care they need and can't increase transmission further. Optat testing in London, Blackpool, Brighton and Manchester has also revealed a quiet but growing crisis identified by people who have previously been diagnosed with HIV, but are not receiving the treatment they need. The UK Health Security Agency estimates the number of people who have fallen out of the HIV care system since 2015 to be an alarming 22,670 people. The Terence Higgins Trust, who I take this opportunity to thank for all their excellent work, estimates the number of those who are alive and remain living in the UK as somewhere between 10,650 and 13,006 people. They're all at risk of becoming seriously ill and further transmitting the virus. In fact, hospitals in London are reporting that this has overtaken undiagnosed HIV as the primary cause of HIV-related hospital admissions. And this is totally preventable. Once someone living with HIV is on effective treatment, they can live a long, healthy life and don't pass on the virus. The annual update shows more than a third of those found with HIV by opt-out testing were previously lost to care. That's another 473 people who can access treatment, prevent further serious illness, and help stop the spread of HIV. This is an important step forward, but we shouldn't only be finding people when they need emergency care, we should be supporting them to stay in care in the first place. Without finding and providing treatment to those people, we can't realise our ambition of ending new cases by 2030. So not only is opt-out testing helping to save lives, it's also helping to save money within our health system. The initial investment to set up opt-out testing is dwarfed by the amount saved from providing treatment earlier and preventing serious illness. There is a huge saving to be made that is truly making a difference to health outcomes in those places of the country that already have opt-out testing. 
Furthermore, the Elton John AIDS Foundation have done fantastic work with hospitals in South London on a pilot scheme that can inform a national programme to re-engage people diagnosed with HIV but are lost to care. Clearly, finding and restarting treatment for those lost to care is an urgent consideration, and at a cost of £3,000 per person, this would be significantly cheaper than the cost of providing emergency care if their condition was to worsen. very important study um, from uh, Elton John Foundation that says with a low amount of money people can be returned to care but there is a problem is there not that sexual health services um, and HIV services are under strain and that money needs to be ring fenced and provided by the government um, so that we can save, uh, spend now to save later. Thank the Honourable Member uh, for his intervention. I know that he does so much work in this area um, and is really a voice to be listened to uh, on, this, on this stuff. Um, so, Dame, Dame Caroline, I've shown that the key benefits of extending the opt-out testing and further lo loss to care work are threefold. Saving lives, saving money and reducing the pressure on the NHS at a time when every effort must be made to reduce waiting lists. At the time of World AIDS Day debate last December, I was assured that the Minister would look closely at the outcomes of the trial once 12 months of data was available, and I hope that he agrees with me that the trial has been a success, as the annual report states, and we should extend the rollout without delay. We already have an excellent programme currently in place ready to support the expansion of combined blood-borne virus testing. After the Government initially invested £20 million and opt out A&E testing through the HIV Action Plan, Funding from the Hepatitis C programme made it possible to add Hep B and Hep C to the programme. The success of this has been, a, has been remarkable, and the Hepatitis C elimination programme is already funding opt-out Hep C testing in further areas. However, without specific funding for HIV, we're missing this opportunity to save even more lives by testing for HIV at the same time. For example, a pilot programme that took place in Leeds Teaching Hospital, where they rolled out opt-out HIV testing alongside Hepatitis testing, in just 17 months, they found 25 people with HIV, along with a combined 297 people found to have Hep B and C. After the end of that pilot, the hospital has been able to secure funding from NHS England to reinstate hepatitis C testing in the emergency department whenever blood is taken. However, it's disappointing that no funding has been provided for HIV testing to go alongside this, especially considering this area is one in which there is a high prevalence of HIV. These are opportunities to test that are currently being wasted. If we're going to expand this further, it has to be combined with bloodborne virus testing. There isn't a hierarchy when it comes to the elimination of viruses, and it's important we make progress against both. We're showing that it's not just better, it's cheaper, more effective, and destigmatising to combine testing. So I'd appreciate it if the Minister could please confirm that a national expansion of opt-out hepatitis C testing would include HIV and Hep B, as should be the case. Another way in which we can stop the spread of this virus is by better utilising PrEP, which has been proven to be very effective at preventing the transmission of HIV. As part of the HIV Action Plan, we committed to an innovation in PrEP delivery to improve access to key groups, including provision in settings outside of sexual and reproductive health services. However, we continue to await a date for when this will start, and I strongly urge the Department to outline this as soon as possible. The Prime Minister recently committed to making other prescription medications, including contraception, available directly from pharmacies. Please can the government consider doing the same for PrEP, which would make a massive difference to so many. By making it easier to access, we can prevent those most at risk from ever being infected with HIV. It needs to be available to people in GP surgeries, pharma pharmacies and online to truly harness the potential that the drug has to stop HIV spreading and to end the inequalities in PrEP access. I hope this is something the Minister can provide an update on when responding in this debate. Of course. She's, she's, dread, she's dreadfully kind. Um, and and I, I hope that she will acknowledge um, to the Minister that many people end up buying PrEP online anyway. Um, and so there is already a market for this where people are accessing it outside of clinics. So the government actually is taking a cautious approach and the people have already marched two miles ahead. And this is a case where the government should take a more reactive approach, following where the people are and actually just get this done to allow people to buy it over the counter with the advisory of blood tests rather than with the compulsion of blood tests. 
I thank the Honourable, Honourable Member again for his intervention. Uh, I totally agree. Um, I'd also like to raise the plight of those people who are living with HIV, but for a variety of factors feel unable to access health care, mainly as a result of the stigma surrounding this and concerns over their mental health. Engagement with this group of people is an important part of the action plan. Please can the Minister use this opportunity today to reassure colleagues that people living with HIV do have the opportunity to seek support and that tailored measures will be introduced to combat the issues that I've raised. Finally, in all parts of the health system, they are responsible for delivering on the action plan. This, short, this is shortly changing with adult HIV services moving from NHS England to ICSs in April 2024. As may be evident, the lines of responsibilities are somewhat blurred, and for that reason, it is key that we clarify as soon as possible the exact lines of authority so that work can be accelerated to deal with the disparity of HIV support across different areas of the country. And I'd again strongly encourage the Minister to provide the House with the information on what the Government are doing to deal with this. Dame Caroline, it's vital that we deliver on the HIV Action Plan, which gives us a genuine opp opportunity to be the first nation in the world to end this epidemic that has both taken and harmed so many lives. By working together and implementing the reforms which the Action Plan sets out, some of which I've mentioned today, we can stop the spread and instead of allowing transmission to go undetected, we can stop the virus in its tracks. Many of these measures are non-burdensome but are highly effective, so it's vital that we act before it's too late. We have a social responsibility to do all we can now and to not delay the implementation of the plan. And I look forward to hearing the government's response. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to plan to call the front benches around about uh, 5.13, to be precise. Uh, so there's, I don't think there's any need to impose any kind of time limit at the moment, but we're looking at roughly about six and a half min minutes her member, if everybody could self-edit. The question is that this House has considered the HIV Action Plan Annual Update 22-23. Florence Eshalami. Thank you, Dame Caroline. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairship this afternoon in this really important and timely debate. And I thank the Honourable Member for West Bromwich East for opening this debate so well, outlining the importance of this Action Plan and what more the Government should be doing. This is a really important area for me because my constituency of Vauxhall has one of the highest rates of HIV prevalence, not just in London, but in the whole of the UK. And 40 years ago, the situation seemed hopeless, but we've seen life-changing improvements in treatment since then. And it's vital that with today's medical advancements, someone on effective medical treatment cannot pass it on. We need to reiterate that loudly and clearly. What we have achieved is incredible and testament to the hard work of so many in our life science industries, as well as people across the NHS, and the many community and charity groups working behind and across the sector. The HIV Action Plan launched by the government in 2021 is a comprehensive strategy aimed at tackling the HIV epidemic across the country. And it focuses on four key areas, prevention, testing and diagnosis, treatment and care, and reducing stigma. However, the progress made in the last year is not equal across all areas. We have to be honest about that. As part of the action plan, hospital emergency departments in London, Brighton, Blackpool and Manchester are testing people for HIV. And I had the opportunity to visit Lewisham Hospital a year and a half ago to see that and listen to those doctors and see the results that it's producing. They quoted to me that the eldest person tested in the a &E for that was an 85-year-old woman. And this programme has identified people living with HIV from groups who are less likely to routinely test, including women, heterosexuals and those of black ethnicities. This is crucial as many of the people in these groups are currently experiencing poorer health outcomes due to late diagnosis. The opt-out testing figures also shows that hundreds of people who have been identified with HIV but are not currently engaged in treatment. Minister, this is simply not good enough. The longer people are living with HIV without medication and support, the sicker they become and they are still able to, to transmit this virus to others. People are not able to engage in medical care for their HIV for a whole variety of reasons. But in each of those, must, 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 more must be done to empower and support vulnerable people to access life-saving treatment and most importantly, meeting their individual needs. People should not be dying of HIV in the UK in 2023. 
That's the reality. And I want to de-echo the points made by the member um, for West Bromwich East in terms of opt-out testing. It works. The results are there. And it's time for us to expand this program to more hospital emergency departments right across the country now. Any further delay from the government on expanding opt-out testing will mean missing a chance to diagnose hundreds of people across England. Everyone has an equal chance of being diagnosed and accessing treatment. To end, um, Dame Caroline, I want to pay tribute to all of the parliamentary groups, and my co-colleagues on the all-party parliamentary group on HIV and AIDS. I'm proud to be one of the co-chairs. And the APPG has been at the forefront of the work for 36 years as one of the longest standing APPG groups, making sure that this really important subject is high on all of us on the parliamentary agenda, regardless of your political background. I'm proud of the work of the APPG to make sure that we are looking at how we as a UK will be one of the first countries to end the transmission of HIV and to help those 106,000 people who are currently living with HIV in the UK. The APPG's hope is that positive news from the HIV Action Plan galvanises the government to go further with their HIV interventions. Our 2030 goals are achievable, but by no means guaranteed. Caroline Noakes. And it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And also, uh, I would like to add my congratulations to my honourable friend for West Bromwich East for having secured this debate and the comments that she has made in it. Much of what I wanted to say, she already has, so that will spare us some time. But I do particularly want to focus on this. I apologise if anyone thinks I'm about to drift out of order. I'm not. The women's health strategy. Because what we know is that the HIV Action Plan has been incredibly effective in uh, increasing the number of men diagnosed with HIV. We have seen a fantastic and sustained fall in HIV incidents for gay, bisexual and other men who have sex with men, but not for women. And that's because there seems to me to be a lack of joined up thinking when it comes to breaking down some of the stigmas and taboos that still exist for women and uh, we need to do more to make sure that they are tested. So this is where I drift off into the women's health strategy because if you read the strategy and it's a comprehensive and excellent document and I pay tribute to you Dame Caroline for making sure that we saw that get over the line but it very clearly states that independent reports have shown too often it is women whom the healthcare system fails to keep safe and fails to listen to. Now look, the document contains some important, some important and crucial points uh, around tackling taboos and stigma and addressing disparities in outcome that might be affected by age, ethnicity, where the woman is from. And it says very clearly in that strategy that those factors should not impact her ability to access services, but they do. And we know that women are less likely to have access to PrEP. They are the least likely group to have their need identified for it. And only 33% in 2021 had had their need identified. They're also the least likely to continue taking PrEP. Certainly what uh, the HIV Action Plan has told us that is that making PrEP available from GPs and the Honourable Gentleman for Brighton Kemp Town made the comment about making medication available more readily from pharmacies. Look, we've already done that for a range of uh, conditions. We make some contraception available readily from pharmacies. For women, we make some forms of HRT available from pharmacies. We make the morning after pill available from pharmacies. What we need to do in order to break down the stigma and taboo is to make sure that PrEP is more accessible from pharmacies. It seems to me to be a complete no-brainer. So look, I would just, I will indeed give way. You made some very good points about PrEP, but also is this not a problem for sexual health and reproductive um, testing uh, um, uh, in clinics as well, where in Britain only one in ten clinics offer online testing, uh, and that means that many people who can't take time off work or get away at the right time just never are able to get tested. Oh, look, the Honourable Gentleman makes a very important point, one that I had completely forgotten, but I did want to highlight, is of course that we know that online testing, receiving test packets through the post, is incredibly discreet, it's very quick, it's easy, it's efficient. 
I know this because even I have availed myself of the services. That has set the Twitter sphere into an absolute frenzy. But it's a really important point, is that in order to be in control of your own health, you need to know. And so annually, I have an HIV test uh, provided to me. I believe it's the Terence Higgins Trust who do that because... Uh, they're a brilliant charity who do fantastic work, not least in providing us with up-to-date information. But they also promote relentlessly the need to make sure that testing kits are available readily and easily through the post online. It is absolutely critical that we have, as we learned, did we not, during the pandemic, the importance of test, 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 uh, which moves me on to test, test, test of the opt-out variety. Look... My constituency in Southampton does not benefit from opt-out testing at present. It's classified as having a high prevalence of HIV with 2.4 adults per every thousand living with HIV in the area. Now, what we know about opt-out testing is that it finds people living with HIV. It brings about an earlier diagnosis in many cases. We all know that earlier treatment is the most effective, and we also know that once somebody on treatment has got to the point where their viral load is undetectable, it's untransmissible. Now, of course, you have to do the maths backwards, don't you, so that we know if people are not diagnosed, if they're not receiving treatment, then they are more likely to be transmitting HIV. And we know that opt-out testing works. We know that it works in Blackpool, it works in London, um, but we know that in Southampton, more than a third of HIV diagnoses are late, which puts people at much greater risk of ill health and indeed death, and it increases the problem of onward transmission. And we also know that women, black Africans, and older people are also more likely to be diagnosed late. So my plea to the Minister is please make sure that we have an expansion of opt-out testing so that we can identify those people from groups who are less likely to be identified. And we know that opt-out testing means that uh, a higher proportion of women and older women are also likely to be identified, which takes me back very neatly to the women's health strategy, which puts people into three stages of life. There is the, the early stage, which is from puberty up to about 24. There's the mid-stage of life, uh, and then there's the, the older people, who are people like me, who have passed their 51st birthday. Um, and the important thing about the women's health strategy is it's absolutely explicit in saying that uh, sexual and health and well-being is relevant across all three of those age groups. And I would make a big plea that we don't forget older people. And I think the Honourable Lady from Vauxhall mentioned a woman of 85 going through opt-out testing. It's absolutely crucially important. It would be remiss of me representing Romsey and Southampton North not to make a quick plea for those living in rural areas who are waiting an average 19 days in order to get an appointment with a sexual health service. That is far too long to be waiting. But I think my final comment is that much of this comes down to education and information. And we know from the Women's Health Strategy that there is a big emphasis on RSHE, and we also know that the Department for Education is conducting a review into that at the moment. We have to teach boys as well as girls about sexual and reproductive health. The best place to do that is via RSHE. And yet a written answer from the Department of Health tells me that there has not yet been any contribution to the RSHE review from the department. I think that's remiss of the DHSE. I think they should be feeding in, in the same way that every other government department that has even a passing interest in the well-being of our young people and their ability to respect themselves and each other should be feeding into that review. So notwithstanding the fact that I've had a very negative answer from the department uh, dated earlier this week, or might have been the latter end of last week, please will the minister take it away back to the department how crucially important it is if we're going to hit that target of living HIV free, we have to have government departments working together on that to make sure it happens. David Mundell. I thank you, Dean Caroline, and it really is a great pleasure to serve under your uh, uh, chairmanship this afternoon. I'm particularly grateful to my uh, honourable friend, the member for West Bromwich East, uh, for sc securing this timely debate and for her very uh, thoughtful contribution, uh, which laid out uh, the, the principal issues. Although I, I, I am also grateful to uh, my Red Honourable Friend for Romsey and Southampton North for making sure that the full gamut, actually, of issues 
uh, were uh, covered because sometimes it is possible uh, for the perception to be that this is just an issue about gay men and it's not. We, we, we've heard, and, and my uh, honourable uh, friend, the uh, member for Vauxhall, who's the co-chair, along with myself and others, of the HIV AIDS group, made absolutely clear that this is a wider, um, a wider issue um, than, that, than just for, for that one group. As the HIV Action Plan has put in print, you know, we have already reached the UN's 95-95-95 target and are... Uh, hopefully within touching distance of ending new transmissions uh, by 2030. And if that can be achieved, we should be clear, clear that this is a milestone equivalent with the eradication in past years of uh, polio. And I believe it's also a tangible example of British leadership in health, a testament to consistent and concerted efforts producing both incremental gains and giant leaps and ultimately a pathway that others uh, have followed. But as we have heard, we're not there yet. Now, the HIV Action Plan makes clear that this goal will not be reached without PrEP. We know that PrEP works with new transmissions of HIV dropping by over a third from 2019. But in a recent survey by Prepster, the National AIDS Trust, Terence Higgins Trust, Sophia Forum and One Voice Network, it was found that it, ha uh, that it uh, has happened that many people uh, end up being diagnosed with HIV while actually waiting uh, for uh, PrEP. And so we need to close this gap between awareness of risk, accessing services and, and receiving PrEP. And I absolutely uh, agree with the, uh, the Honourable Member uh, from Brighton, Kemp Town, about the availability uh, of PrEP. I could sit down, uh, Dame Caroline, after this speech, I could go on my phone and I could order PrEP to be delivered to me from India uh, in the next uh, few days. But I could not go uh, to a pharmacy here uh, in the centre of London. Uh, or indeed in my own constituency, uh, to receive that. Now, not only uh, is that uh, discriminatory in the sense that those people who can uh, afford uh, to buy it or access online uh, services uh, have, uh, uh, have, an, have an advantage, it is, uh, I think, as the Honourable uh, Member uh, previously suggested, it's, not, uh, it, it, it's putting the, the risk ahead of the reality uh, that people are already accessing it, and far better to access it from uh, the source of a pharmacy uh, than from uh, an, an Indian online uh, uh, or other uh, overseas uh, uh, supplier. Nor will uh, new transmissions uh, be, uh, the, our targets on new transmissions be reached if we've not identified uh, those who are living uh, with HIV, and we've heard uh, um, uh, others uh, speak in relation to that. Many of these issues are, are devolved in relation uh, uh, to Scotland, but uh, one thing that I would like to see there uh, is a properly funded national testing week uh, and to maximise its impact for it to work in tandem uh, with that which already takes place in England, because I think this uh, often a UK-wide uh, event, a focus, it being on national uh, television, in the national uh, media, in social media, uh, is much better than drawing uh, a way of drawing attention uh, to a, such a, uh, a, an event. And I think that we've heard as well, and I can confirm, uh, like my right honourable friend, that even I am able to use a, a, a test a kit, and I'm, I'm grateful uh, that, uh, a, and this will interest the Honourable Member for, for Vauxhall, that, that the funding is at least better now in Vauxhall because uh, you used to have to phone up at 3 a.m. to get the kit, because otherwise, if you tried to phone by about 9 a.m., all the kits had, for that day had been uh, distributed. Uh, but now you seem to be able to be uh, able to get them 24. Uh, hours a day, but the, the, any, uh, virtually anyone, I think, can use a, uh, such a kit a, effectively. As the action plan itself identifies, reaching those who do not know that they're living with HIV will necessarily mean 
uh, targeting hard to reach parts of our society and those who do not see themselves at risk or ignore the risk because of stigma. Opt-out testing has proven to be a success in this regard and is also uh, cost effective. And Dame Caroline, I had the opportunity when in South Africa to hear directly from medical professionals there that in relation to women where opt-out testing uh, applies, uh, that it has, it has had a remarkable effect in the identification uh, of uh, cases. Now, there are issues with support and treatment, but in terms of identification uh, of cases, South Africa demonstrates that opt-out testing uh, has a proven uh, record, and we shouldn't uh, prevaricate uh, before rolling out uh, opt-out testing beyond uh, the areas uh, already identified. Uh, there are agencies and charities that are chomping at the bit to partner uh, the government to do just uh, that. Um, no new transmissions is almost tangible, but as with progress uh, that we've already made, it will not come without consistent and concerted uh, action. And like the uh, Honourable Lady from uh, Vauxhall, uh, I commend the all-party group on HIV and AIDS uh, for its commitment to continuing uh, and, the, and, the, and all the members across the House, uh, both Houses who are part of it, uh, for the continued commitment uh, to uh, action. And uh, as she did, I can vouch that the group will continue to work with any charity, trust, health board or government uh, to get our country to the position of no new uh, transmissions and also to highlight that issue globally. Thank you. Thank you, Dame Caroline, and it's a privilege to serve under your chairmanship today. I want to congratulate my honourable friend on leading this very important and timely debate. As I remarked in a PMQ in February this year, it was the 22nd anniversary of the death of a good friend of mine from AIDS-related complications. I'm absolutely certain that had he been tested earlier, and more regularly, he would have been given the right treatment and would still be alive today. It is for people like him that this issue is so important to me. Now, Dame Caroline, I am entirely supportive of the government's commitment made in 2019 to end all new HIV transmissions in England by 2030. Whilst we have made some progress, we cannot be complacent. We should rightly celebrate the successes we have seen in improving HIV treatment, prevention, management and care. But without testing, you cannot treat. And without PrEP, you cannot prevent further infection. It's great that HIV positive people now experience a similar life expectancy to people without HIV. But we've still got a lot of work to do. And while new HIV diagnoses have continued to fall, late diagnoses remain stubbornly high in England and progress across the UK is not equitable. There are three key areas we need to see more action on. Access to PrEP, more <coughs> HIV testing, and care for people living with HIV. Access to PrEP, as we've already heard, remains limited. The HIV Action Plan included a commitment to develop a plan for PrEP access beyond sexual health services, but more than a year on from that commitment, you still cannot access PrEP at a pharmacy or in GP surgeries. Can I ask the Minister why that is? And can he urgently look at this point? This is really an easy win in our fight against HIV. The HIV Action Plan included a £20 million investment in opt-out testing in emergency departments in areas classed as very high prevalence. As a result of additional funding from hepatitis C funding, the whole of London was included in that programme to tackle blood-borne viruses. And the annual report includes the first year of data, and the results have been quite remarkable across London, Manchester, Blackpool and Brighton, as other speakers have highlighted. These figures demonstrate the huge success that opt-out testing has had in rooting out cases of blood-borne viruses, not just HIV, but hepatitis C and B too. I know that in February, as a result of campaigning from many colleagues here and stakeholders across the country, the Public Health Minister committed to consider the case for expanding opt-out testing to all areas with a high 
HIV prevalence. Can the Minister tell us the outcome of that review and when we will see opt-out testing rolled out to those high prevalence areas? People do not live their whole lives in fixed locations and simply because someone now lives in an area that is not high prevalence does not mean that they did not once do so or visited such areas in the past. Opt-out testing is a win-win, good for public health and good for the public purse. Dame Caroline, it is essential that we meet our target of ending all new HIV transmissions in England by 2030. We've made progress, but I fear that without renewed impetus, greater access to PrEP and an expansion of opt-out testing, we will miss the mark. Our internationally significant position on HIV is in no small part due to the zeal of giants in this field, such as Lord Fowler and the efforts of the Terence Higgins Trust. I ask the Minister to rekindle that zeal and energy to ensure that we do really take up this mantle and race towards a day when we have no new infections. It can be done. Thank you, Dan Caroline, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to contribute to this debate on the annual update from the government on its HIV plan, action plan, and I thank the member for West Bromwich East for securing the debate. Having read the annual update, it is clear to see that progress has been made, but the plan has set the stage, and the plan has set the stage for a transformative approach to prevention, testing, treatment and support. But, as ever, there is still room for improvement. Uh, and here the annual report highlights several key opportunities. First among them is, is a scope for improvement um, on access to HIV prevention drug PrEP, as we've discussed, HIV testing and care for people living with HIV. As the Member of Parliament for the Cities of London and Westminster, I know how important all this is. Reports show that Westminster has amongst the highest prevalence of HIV in the country, with eight people living with HIV per 1,000, 15 to 59 year olds in the area. But this action plan works to change these statistics and the government's 20 million pound investment in opt-out HIV testing in emergency departments in areas classed by the UK Health Security Agency as having a very high HIV prevalence should be highly commended. As a result, a result of additional funding in St Mary's Hospital in my constituency alone Three people were newly diagnosed with HIV, seven with hepatitis B and 14 with hepatitis C in the first 10 months of the government's programme. These figures from the first year of the programme have been broken down by the Terence Higgins Trust, with more than 2,000 positive diagnoses overall across London, Blackpool, Brighton and Manchester. Now we are in the second year of the programme, I think it is only right we consider the case for expanding the opt-out of testing. Indeed, I understand NHS England has costed and prepared the case for expand, expanding HIV testing to, the addition, to 41 additional a and &E in areas with high prevalence of HIV, and I really do hope this is going to go ahead. Modelling by the Terence Higgins Trust shows that this expansion has serious merit to support the government's aims and ambitions. Also important to support the aims of the action plan is increasing equal access to PrEP, and we've heard in the debate today how important it is. This drug, we know, is revolutionary and has changed lives for so many, including many of my own friends. And I feel proud that my constituency is home to the outstanding 56 Dean Street, the sexual health clinic which pioneered PrEP in England. 56 Dean Street is recognised internationally for its innovation, particularly in regard to its engagement of London's higher risk communities. More than this, 56 Dean Street has been a haven for so many of the LGBT plus community over the de decades. And I want to pay tribute to the outstanding staff who work there today and have done in the past. They have always operated without prejudice, even in, face, in the face of systematic discrimination. But looking at the PrEP um, uh, uh, situation, we do now understand that nearly 60% are waiting more than 12 weeks for their PrEP. And to this end, I'm glad to see that the annual report acknowledges the publication of the first national PrEP monitoring and evaluation framework, 
but I think there's more to do. And the framework is it's clear that there are inequalities in who is able to access PrEP, and it needs to be really, really pushed on this. Now, the HIV Action Plan includes a commitment to develop a plan to, ex to expand access to PrEP, of course, through sexual health services, but I do think there is a case to be made to have it access through GP surgeries in particular, as well as pharmacies. Um, and I think that we do really need to specifically ensure that we have equal access to PrEP if we are going to make our 2030 uh, commitments. Um, Madam, Dame, Dame um, Caroline, in the remaining time I have left today, I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the work of the Terence Higgins Trust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. From their policy to their fundraising efforts, they are second to none in their field. And in fact, I have been to visit their brilliant team in boutique, the only Terence Higgins charity shop in the UK, and it happens to be based in Pimlico in my constituency, and they have just reached the million pound charity uh, uh, money they raise for charity, um, and they've only done that recently, and I think this is utterly amazing, and I have to say I pay tribute to all the volunteers who um, are, are working there. For nearly 15 years, the shop has helped the Terence Higgins Trust fund their hardship grant, services for people living with HIV, and its campaign to end new cases in 2030. So I, I will pay huge tribute to both the shop and to the Terence Higgins Trust. Madam Chairman, the government's HIV action plan is the first step to reinforcing the progress the UK has already achieved. Now government... Civil society, organisations, healthcare providers, researchers and communities must continue to work together to address the global challenge. By combining our knowledge, resources and expertise, we can develop innovative solutions, advocate for policy change and create a sustainable impact that will shape the future of HIV prevention and treatment. Thank you all members for keeping to time so beautifully. I now call Andrew Gwynn. Uh, thank you, Dame Caroline. It's always a pleasure to see you in the chair, and I would also like to congratulate the Honourable Lady, the member for West Bromwich East, for securing this important debate. And it's been a good debate. We've had um, consensual contributions from across the House, and I want to pay tribute to my Honourable Friend, the member for uh, Vauxhall, uh, the Right Honourable Lady, the member for Romsey and Southampton North, uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman, the member for Dumfriesshire, Clydesdale and Tweedsdale, uh, and uh, the members for the cities of London and Westminster and indeed Darlington uh, for very thoughtful contributions and to thank them individually as well for the work that they are all doing on this important topic here in the House of Commons. Dame Caroline, the publication of the first HIV Action Plan update in Parliament last month showed real positive progress in ending new HIV cases and HIV-related deaths in England by 2030. However, as a number uh, of new HIV cases falls, it will become harder to find people living with undiagnosed HIV, something we've recognised in the debate today. I therefore welcome the opportunity to press the Minister on some key points, particularly regarding the HIV Action Plan update. The first relates to opt-out HIV and hepatitis testing. The inclusion of opt-out testing in areas of very high HIV prevalence, something that Labour has called for for some time, has been hugely successful. Across London, Manchester, Blackpool and Brighton, we've seen 343 people newly diagnosed with HIV, over 1,500 people newly diagnosed with hepatitis B and C, and 473 people previously lost to care found. These are incredibly encouraging statistics and they point to the effectiveness of opt-out testing. I'd be grateful then if the Minister could set out what assessment the government has made of opt-out testing being implemented in areas of high prevalence and if not does he have any plans to do so? The second thing I wanted to focus on Dame Caroline were those people lost to care. Uh, by loss to care, we mean those previously diagnosed with HIV, but who have not attended an HIV clinic in the last year. In general, these people are disproportionately likely to be black women, and most likely to be from the most deprived parts of the country, or have 
caring responsibilities or uh, they uh, are subject to the misuse of drugs and alcohol. The Terence Higgins Trust, who I also commend, they do brilliant work and I thank them for uh, their support to me uh, in this role, estimate that the number of people lost to care um, who are alive and uh, still in the UK could be as high as 13,000. This is extremely concerning and it means that not only are there individuals at risk of developing serious HIV-associated illness, but there's also the risk of them passing the virus on to others. So what action is the department taking to re-engage uh, these individuals and what further work is the minister planning to take nationally to support people back into care? The third and final point I want to ask the Minister about is access to PrEP and sexual health services more generally. Because we know and we've heard in the course of this debate that there are serious inequalities in PrEP identification and initiation. And even when people are accessing care, they are facing extraordinarily long waiting times with 57% of people waiting more than 12 weeks to receive their PrEP. Tragically, the Terence Higgins Trust say that they are aware of people who have acquired HIV whilst waiting to access PrEP. That's clearly unacceptable. These cases were entirely preventable and they should uh, seriously alarm ministers. The HIV Action Plan included a commitment to develop a plan for PrEP access beyond sexual health services. However, more than a year on from that commitment... There isn't a pharmacy or GP surgery in the country where PrEP is accessible. I know from written responses uh, to parliamentary questions that the Minister is still committed to this aspect of the HIV Action Plan. So when can we expect this to be set out in detail? The Government initially promised their PrEP Action Plan in the autumn of 2022. We're now three days away from summer recess in 2023. So where is the plan? Uh, Dame Caroline, in closing, uh, I just wanted uh, to uh, raise the issue of sexual health services and to ask the Minister about government proposals to change Schedule 1 of the Health Protection Notification Regulations, which lists notifiable diseases. What guarantees can the Minister give that this will not impact on uh, the important anonymity for those accessing sexual health services or increase stigma. Labour stands ready and waiting to support the government in driving down HIV prevalence. I'm sure that the Minister will agree that across the House we have a responsibility to redouble our efforts so that we can eliminate all new transmissions of HIV by 2030. Hopefully with cross-party action we can make that a reality. to start by paying tribute to my honourable friend for West Bromwich East uh, and indeed for all other honourable members here today. There's a number of members here who've played absolutely leading uh, role in campaigning on this um, issue and this afternoon we've had an excellent debate uh, hearing important contributions about particular aspects of this challenge uh, from my right honourable friend uh, for Romsey and Southampton North about the dimension uh, for women um, from the honourable member uh, for Brighton Kemp Town about the opportunities for home testing the Honourable Lady from Vauxhall about the importance of this for her constituency. We heard about the inspirational work of centres like 56 uh, Dean Street for my Honourable Friend uh, for cities in London and Westminster and indeed the searing personal experience of friends and family of people uh, suffering and dying from this terrible disease for my Honourable Friend uh, from Darlington. Happy to give way. Can I mention one other uh, clinic which is 10 Hammersmith Broadway which mm. I visited very recently and was hugely impressed by the the staff and their partners in the community like Terence Higgins Trust, but it's clear that they are under increasing stress and the problem is it only takes an emergency like an outbreak of MPOX or STIs going up and routine services like supply, supply of PrEP go, go, on to, on to, uh, go on to the back foot in that way. Will the Minister look at this, particularly in high prevalence areas, because the cost is not it's not worth, the, the limited cost is not worth the great risk that this involves. Mm -hmm. uh, abs absolutely happy to look at that, um, uh, Dame Caroline. And indeed, we did provide extra funding around um, MPOX, but I absolutely look at the issues the Honourable Gentleman raises. This debate is an opportunity for us to uh, reinstate our, our joint commitment to tackling HIV and reflect on the progress that we've made since 2019 when this government first announced our ambition to end new HIV 
transmissions, AIDS diagnosis, and new HIV-related deaths within England by 2030. Uh, as all honourable members know, 30 years ago, AIDS was a fatal illness. Today, when diagnosed early and with access to antiretrovirals, the majority of people with HIV uh, in England can expect a near normal life expectancy. People diagnosed with HIV can expect to receive HIV care that is world-class, free and open access. And we've come a long way. Despite the unprecedented and challenging backdrop of the COVID pandemic, England has seen a 33% fall in new HIV diagnoses since 2019. And less than 4,500 people live with undiagnosed HIV. The vast majority of those uh, diagnosed are on high quality treatment and now unable to pass on the virus, something that still, as a number of members have mentioned this afternoon, still not enough people know uh, that that is the case for people who are on high quality treatment. Um, these successes have only been possible through clear national leadership and strengthened partnership working. And I'm incredibly grateful to Professor Kevin Fenton, the government's chief advisor on HIV, who's been chairing the HIV Action Plan Implementation Steering Group, representing the key partners involved in delivery of the HIV Action Plan including local government, uh, UK HSA, the NHS, professional bodies, and our voluntary and community sector. And that steering group's met uh, quarterly throughout the year to monitor progress on our commitments and ensure appropriate action is being taken to help us move forward. Uh, within the remit of that group, we've established a community advisory group comprised of representatives from a wide range of uh, community and voluntary groups, because we know we have a lot to learn from them. And four task and finish groups to support PrEP access and equity, the workforce, HIV control strategies in lower prevalence areas, and retention and engagement in HIV care. And these groups provide vital, comprehensive and timely advice to help remain on track to our 2030 goal. Many areas of the country have replicated uh, this national action regionally, providing leadership uh, and oversight of work underway within local systems. So, for example, we've seen regional uh, HIV action plans developed in areas like the Southwest, multi-agency working groups in the Midlands, stock takes of testing activity and actions uh, via sexual health networks in the Southeast and Northeastern Yorkshire, happy to give way. Um, I'm very about action plans in, in regions. Do those regional plans include opt-out testing? I, I'm going to come on to this point about opt-out testing um, in a moment, uh, Dame Caroline. We're also incredibly grateful for the work of the um, UK uh, Health Security Agency, which is really a world-class organisation running high-quality data collection and surveillance systems to help better understand the scale of the challenge. Okay, so we've published the first monitoring evaluation report on the HIV Action Plan on December uh, 2022, indicating that achievement of our ambitious commitments, uh, including the interim commitment to an 80% reduction in transmission by 2025, is within our grasp, grasp uh, and we should be encouraged by the progress that's already been made. Our progress in the UK, as, as various honourable members have pointed out, uh, is uh, increasingly recognised internationally at different HIV global forums, such as UNAIDS and WHO uh, international boards. And a proof of that, as our honourable members have pointed out, is that the UK met the UNAIDS 95-95-95 targets for the second time in 2021. So 95% of HIV positive individuals diagnosed, 99% um, uh, receiving uh, treatment, and 98% of those receiving treatment being virally suppressed and unable to pass on uh, this disease. Transparency and accountability are key cornerstones of our plan. That's why we also committed to update Parliament each year on progress made towards our ambition to end new HIV transmissions. In particular, we're very committed to ensure that underserved populations benefit equally from improvements being made in HIV outcomes. And this includes scaling up our prevention efforts and increasing access to PrEP. We've already invested 33 million to roll out PrEP across sexual health services over the last two years, and PrEP is now being commissioned as a routine service through the public health grant. However, we know that there is more to do to improve PrEP access and equity for key groups, and we're in the process of developing a roadmap based on the input of that PrEP task and finish uh, group that I mentioned to improve PrEP provision and help us reach those who are being underrepresented in PrEP access. Now, the Honourable Gentleman uh, for Brighton Kemp Town, who's had to leave, raised the issue of the blood test, which I'll absolutely take away uh, and look at. But to address this point about timing specifically, which was raised by my uh, Honourable Friend for Darlington and Right Honourable Friend for Dumfriesshire, Clydesdale and Tweesdale, um, uh, the HIV Plan Implementation Steering Group um, is working to develop a roadmap based on that task and finish group's recommendations to help guide uh, our moves forward on this. Our work will be informed by the uh, findings of research commissioned by the English HIV and Sexual Health uh, Commissioners Group for the use of HIV PrEP, particularly to understand the barriers for underserved groups to access PrEP and how those barriers can be mitigated. And that research is expected to be published this month. And of course, there is not much less of this month. So honorable members will see that very shortly because we know 
the urgency of this, and I am very struck by uh, the testimony of honourable members here uh, today about what is happening in terms of private access and the need for people to access uh, PrEP in a timely and uh, smooth um, uh, way. Now, a number of honourable members, of course, have uh, raised the issue of the opt-out testing programme. Uh, and when I've met some of the people who've benefited uh, from that programme already, it powerfully, powerfully underlines the huge benefit of that uh, incredible programme. Preliminary results from that pilot are promising, and we are still considering the full evidence from the first year of the programme, alongside the data on progress towards our ambition of ending new transmissions. Uh, through the HIV Action Plan, DHSC is also investing 3.5 million in our national HIV prevention program from 2021 to 2024 to raise awareness of ways to prevent the spread of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections indeed among the most affected communities. And as part of that program, we deliver a national HIV testing week in partnership with Terence Higgins Trust, which in 2023 distributed almost 22,000 HIV free testing kits ordered by the public with self-testing uh, kits providing instant at home uh, results available for the very first time. And a targeted summer campaign is also currently being delivered through the brilliant work of our partners at the Terence Higgins Trust. The campaign has been very carefully developed and tailored through strong audience insight evaluation to help us reach those most at risk. And it aims to increase those testing amongst key groups, particularly among young people, people of African heritage, and as well as to promote awareness of good sexual health practices to prevent transmission to other sexually trans submitted infections. Now, to reassure my uh, right honourable friend uh, for Romsey and Southampton North, we absolutely are working with the DfE and have been doing since March on their RSHE uh, review, so absolutely recognise the, the central importance of the point that she was making. Achieving our 2030 goal will require sustained commitment from many, many partners across the health system and beyond in education, for example, and the HIV Action Plan describes the role each partner will play in this uh, vital endeavour. The success of recent years and the scale of the task which remains should give us the belief, but also the drive to go further in the years ahead. Let's continue working together to ensure that we are the generation that ends HIV once and for all. Nicola Richards, you wind up. Thank you, Dame Caroline. Um, I'd like to thank all honourable and right honourable members for taking part in today's debate. Uh, we all said very similar things, and I hear from the Minister that the first year of data is still being analysed from the opt-out testing trial, I think he would agree with us that so far it looks very promising. And I'd just like to reiterate, we have all the knowledge we need to end new transmissions of, H new transmissions of HIV by 2030 in the UK. We have the tools to do it, we have the knowledge to do it, we just need to get on and do it. So I'd urge the Minister to please speed up the work on this, because it will be an incredible achievement of this government to end new transmission by 2030 through the programmes we've set up, it is possible. We can do it. We've got to get on with it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The HIV Action Plan Annual Update 2022-2023.